Hello again. I was thinking the other day about when first I went to Israel and lived on the kibbutz, uh, the kibbutz Zima collective settlements, collective farms um, in Israel. Uh, they've changed a lot in recent years, but when first I went, there was strict equality between the sexes and between each individual person. They, they were um, essentially Marxist communes. This was in the 1970s. The place had originally been set up on strictly Marxist principles of true equality, and in particular, gender equality. Photographs from the 1930s show women driving tractors and wielding scythes, and men looking after babies and cooking. There was never the slightest pressure on either men or women to conform to traditional roles. Quite the opposite, in fact. Yet 40 years later, all the childcare was being undertaken by women. The heavy agricultural work and engineering was all done by men. There was no rule about this. It was just that given a free choice, the men preferred to work out in the field rather than looking after babies. And in the same way, the women didn't really want to be fixing a tractor if it broke down. One of the things which I've observed over the years is that men and women often seem to prefer different things. I don't doubt for a moment that um, viewers have noticed this for themselves. These differences begin very young and I'm not at all sure that they are at all related to conditioning by a sexist society. Female babies, for instance, show far more interest in human faces than boys do long before they could possibly have been indoctrinated to feel that way. It's just how things are. As they grow up, females prefer people and males prefer, well, things. If you look at magazines in a, a news agent, you will see that the magazines for women usually feature faces and people. Those for men feature th objects, uh, guitars, motorbikes, cars, stuff like that. It's just one of those, what seem to me, to be natural divisions. Here is another personal anecdote. At one time, I ran a playgroup and toy libraries, in fact, I ran a network of playgroups um, in the London borough of Hackney, which I'm sure that some viewers will know is the one of the most right-on places to work. We made sure that the boys were encouraged to play with the little brooms and the girls to take advantage of the plastic spanners and construction toys. The only thing boys ever did with the brooms was to either hurl them like spears or hold them with the brush at their shoulders and pretend that they were rifles. Of course, no toy guns were around, but that didn't matter because the boys would managed to make pistols from duplo bricks or failing that find sticks which they could pretend were swords or machine guns. Meanwhile the girls were wrapping the spanners up in bits of cotton wool and making believe that they were babies. <laughs> what prompted all these recollections was seeing the um, a report recently that the countries with the most women university graduates in STEM subjects, that is to say science, technology, engineering and mathematics, are the ones where women lack equality. Conversely, uh, nations which promote equality for women, Sweden for example, have very low rates of women who opt to study these things at university. On the face of it, this is a great mystery. After all, Algeria doesn't have a particularly enlightened attitude towards women and women's rights, and yet they have a higher percentage of women among graduates in STEM subjects than Sweden, Norway and Finland. It's the same with Albania, another country um, whose traditional views of women and their proper role are not all that progressive. Why on earth after many decades of encouraging women to go into science and engineering, should fewer women than ever be choosing to study these subjects at Swedish universities? On the face of it, it's really a bit puzzling. 
One thing which has been noticed is that um, the more welfare benefits that are available and the greater the opportunity to choose university subjects which students like rather than just those which will prove useful to them in gaining well-paid careers, the less likely young women are to opt for STEM subjects. In Algeria, there are no regular benefits. You don't just sign on the dole if you haven't got a job nor are there grants for students to study at university. So women tend to go for things which will guarantee them a well-paid job when they graduate. Uh, engineering's a good bet, and so they gravitate towards it. In Sweden, though, where whatever they choose to study, women are not going to starve or go without the good things in life, um, women feel more able to select a subject which they actually want to do. And one of the things they don't want to do, if they have a free choice in the matter, is to study science, technology, engineering or mathematics. I'm not suggesting for a moment that the way that children are raised has no effect on whether they'll want to have a job looking after children when they grow up or prefer to be garage mechanics. Of course, the examples which they see modelled by their parents and the rest of society all that's bound to make a difference to them. I think, though, there's probably a limit to the extent to which those things actually alter growing children. In Britain, there is absolutely no stigma in a girl attending a further education college and going on a BTEC course in plumbing or electrical installation, any more than there would be in a boy choosing to study childcare or hairdressing. On such courses, though, you'll find that 99.99% of the students doing vehicle maintenance are boys and that there are seldom any boys at all on the childcare courses. Are there inherent differences between men and women, other, of course, than the purely physical ones that we all know about? My own view is that this is very likely, um, I'm, but I'm ready to be proved wrong. Even trifling matters, such as the very different way that men and women will react when handed a pistol to examine, uh, shed light on this, or so I think. A man will automatically heft a pistol in his hand and sight down the barrel. Perhaps he'll cock the piece and make as though to aim at a distant target. A woman, on the other hand, will take the thing gingerly and hold it like something unfamiliar and perhaps menacing. Is this because it's a piece of machinery, though, or does it have to do with the aggressive instinct? I've no idea at all about this, but it's just one more of the things which I've noticed over the years.